It's raining cats and dogs, and I hope your windshield wipers are working well today. Good Saturday morning, and welcome to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I'm Matt Allen, your KTR car guy, along with Dave Riccio, the automotive therapist. (laughs) We're here every single Saturday from 11 to noon on 92.3 KTAR. We're putting you in the know when it comes to car stuff. We're here to help you, and we encourage you to call 602 277-5827, 202-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. Today on the Bumper to Bumper Roadmap, does my computer need a reflash? And what is that? Open phones, of course, and suspension and bushing and CV joints. What are they and what are the noises and what about wet weather driving? The biggest thing about the rain is it rains so infrequent in this town, I can never remember how to turn on my windshield wipers in my Honda Element. It is not built for the elements, <laughs> apparently. And this morning, I wanted to turn on the rear windshield wiper, and I really didn't know how to do that. So I actually got out the manual. How do I turn on these wipers? <laughs> We're pulling your man card, Dave. <laughs> you got out the manual. I got out the manual. Well, I would think you'd be getting the manual out to figure out how to turn the rear wiper off, because usually we see those going in the summertime, and it's just wiping, and, <laughs> and they're on because you don't know how the heck you turned it on. Well, you or go, how the, how you go to the car wash, they wash your car, and you leave, and your rear wiper's on, and go, what do these guys do? Or how do I turn it off? <laughs> no, but... Uh, the wiper blades, I, I hope that you have nice uh, wiper blades in your car on a weekend like we're going to have, and I don't know what the rest of the forecast is like, but th- it can ruin your day not having good wipers or defrosters or anything like that for that matter. But it is a sa- Wiper blades is a safety issue because you want good visibility when you're driving in the rain. You've got to see stuff sooner because you're going to take longer to stop. And uh, today's show should have been brought to you by s Tire because tires are such a big deal when it comes to driving in the rain. Well, there's all kinds of stuff. I mean, we need to be cautious. We've had enough rain already. One of the first things you need to remember to watch for when it starts to rain is all that oil, if you just get a sprinkle, it just rises up and gets on the surface. We need a good rain like we've had overnight to wash that down. So our roads are not going to be as slip, slick, I was going to say slickery. Slickery, <laughs> yeah. Slickery. Sounds like a NASCAR term. <laughs> yes. But they're not going to be as, as slick like that at, when it originally started as they are right now. So that's a good thing. So so the roads are clear now. We just need to slow down a little bit. Slow, yeah, slow, slow your space. roll because you don't realize when you do get in a panic stop how you are going to stop. And if you feel the ABS, just lay on those pedals. Yeah, People yeah. want to – we don't pump pedals anymore. We just – if you're going to do an ABS stop, you just nail the brakes and hold them down. Well, that's – you know, we didn't even talk about that, David. <laughs> you bring it up, but if – Maybe go on. Today's a good day to be in a parking lot, maybe at the high school where there's nobody around, and go experience what it's like to to engage your anti lock brakes. Just go step on the brakes and and step on them hard because it's a weird feeling. If you've never had it happen, you might might spook you a little bit. You might get in your own little panic because that brake pedal sometimes it just wants to push it right back at you, or sometimes it just fades down. And you got to remember the electronics of the brakes have taken over. You are no longer in control at that point. I'm an absolute gearhead, and when it rains like this, I can't wait to get the car sideways and <laughs> turn or lock up the brakes, and the car anymore doesn't let you get away with much because so there's could, traction control. You can do a burnout now in your, uh, in your element. <laughs> My element's all-wheel drive with traction control. It, it, no fun, you know? So, But avoid the right shoulder of the road. That's where all, you know our drainage in, in Phoenix is terrible on the roads because when we built the freeways, we, we, we figured it wasn't going to rain. So we just didn't even need drainage. The, the curb lane gets full. Sometimes. Full of the water. So uh, maybe it is a good underwash for your car because I find every puddle and I, I sometimes, import. Sometimes, sometimes. <laughs> and the other thing, don't don't be the guy in the news. <laughs> yeah, right. That, usually, you will be that guy. If it looks too deep, it is. Don't too go deep. across. Just don't bother. You're going to hurt yourself. You're going to hurt your passengers. You risk the life of a rescue worker. And then you're going to screw up your car, too, because at that point, if you're getting rescued, your car's ruined. Well, I know. It's, it sounds like it's going to rain for two or three more days. So if this morning you woke up and you're like, oh, I should have got wiper blades when the guy recommended it to me two weeks ago, it's not too late. Uh, if you're going to go to the auto parts store and you're going to do it yourself, I generally recommend the whole wiper blade versus the little refill thing. Some cars, the little refill thing works out. Some, I'm thinking of some European cars with high-end uh, wiper pieces where you just change that little sleeve out. You can rough them up a little bit, you know, scuff them up, shine them up, and 
maybe they'll go to work in. But wiper blade is almost an annual thing in Arizona. Well, and the thing to do is is lift the wiper blade off the window, and your first thing you'll notice it probably well not not yet anymore today, but it'll stick like Velcro. It's coming off the window, but look at each tip on the long end, and first just pull on that on the on the rubber wedge and see if it starts to peel. If it peels back, you know you need wipers. If you can give that a slight tug and it doesn't tear but it's just not wiping the window well, yeah, a little emery cloth or a Brillo pad out of the sink, kind of an old worn-out sponge, and just scuff that blade surface a little bit, and they might start working well. Well, I've had enough emails at BumperToBumperRadio.com, people asking CV boot and axle questions for the front-wheel drive, and I thought, you know, we just have not taken the time to explain what the heck a CV joint is, what the heck a CV boot is, and what the heck an axle is in, in, in my car. So if you drive a front-wheel drive car, which is most of us anymore, even the SUVs have moved to a primarily front-wheel drive car. Basically, you got your engine and your transmission up in the front, car, front of the car. From the right side of the transmission to the right wheel, there's an axle shaft. From the left side of the transmission to the left wheel, there's another axle shaft. On each of those axle shafts, there are joints. And what the joints allow to do... CV joints. CV joints. Constant velocity. They allow the the axle not only to rotate as as your tire spins uh, down the road, as you would think, but you can also turn the wheel left and right, and that joint picks up that left to right movement, as well as when the suspension compresses, the axle actually will get longer or shorter, but there's also another angle in there. So there's three different angles that it's, it's dealing with. Those joints are protected by rubber boots, and what the rubber boots do is they house the grease that lubricates that joint. Well, and you've got to remember, this this axle, you're going 60 miles an hour, this little axle in there, and that grease wants to fly out. The boot's holding on for dear life to hold it all in. So that's what the boot is keeping the grease in. The other thing it's doing is keeping dirt and grime out. So you may be at the auto shop, and they say, hey, you've got a torn CV boot. We want to take care of that for you, and it's going to cost X amount of dollars. And you think, well, how do I know I you know, need one of those? What I mean, CV boots, the materials have gotten better over the years, uh, but we used to see them fail earlier. But I would say eighty to 120000 Well, a couple things happen. You, you, you won't know it if you just have a CV boot fail. You lose the grease. It starts to make a mess around the brake area, and we'll see sand and little road grime and, and junk collecting there and there will be no symptom for a for a bad boot you let that boot go long enough and then you have a bad joint which a, otherwise it's an axle and then that will be a symptom and we were talking about it when you're making a sharp turn either into a parking spot or a u-turn you're going to get that clickety clickety clackety clackety i yeah. can't help but drive you know everywhere i walk i hear i hear cars drive by I know. Like, does it drive you crazy? that one's got a bad half shaft and that's the other thing we refer to them as half shafts and how do we fix the boot in the old days labor used to be a lot cheaper and you know uh we would take the axle out and we would change the boot clean the joint put new grease put a new boot on and, and we would typically only do one boot. It's usually that nine times out of ten, it's the outer boot that fails. So we pop the axle out, like you said, Dave. We cut the old boot off, clean it all up. And now you've, in, in today's dollars and cents with materials and labor, to do it like we did it 20 years ago, it just doesn't make sense. Because now you've spent almost as much money to replace one boot on the axle as opposed to now we can just buy a complete axle assembly. Two new joints. Two new joints, two new boots whole new axle it's complete you pay less labor and you get more you get more for your money because you were only really fixing half of the problem but it used to be always the outer joints went bad but now we, we see that we see boots leaking so sometimes we can just reband those right in the car just put new bands on them spend 25 or 40 dollars as opposed to maybe 250 and up depending on on the application for an axle well, some cars, it makes more sense to go ahead and still do the reboot. And I'll just use a – you guys work on BMWs a lot, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk BMW. Uh, is a remanufactured half shaft, is that cost competitive, or is it still more economical to do a boot on that particular well, car? Well, Volvo would be one of the models where – on some of the models where the axles aren't readily available or they're not very popular, it makes more sense to do a boot, and we can do those. The, the Beamers don't – you know, they're in the back. That's where they would re, typically re, be referred to – as a half shaft, and so they don't, they're not turning on the, like a front-wheel drive car. So you typically aren't – we don't see very much failure on those. They're going to have some leakage maybe. But then the other reason we replace axles a lot of time is vibration. You could have a slight 
vibration or shudder feeling on maybe a five to, in that five to 15, 20 mile an hour range or passing gear, 55 to 70, you get, you get a shudder. And that's typically a sign of a bad or worn out axle. And we'll see those in the 80,000 mile range. We're here to help you with your car, and we've got open lines at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTR. You are listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio here on a soggy Saturday morning. I am Dave Riccio here along with Matt Allen, and we are here to help you with your car. We've got open lines at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR, and Matt had a birthday yesterday. He just I just found out about it now. He was telling me that he had a birthday. And I'm You're thinking, supposed to know, Dave. I don't know these things. How old are you? 43. 43. That's yes, about sir. when glasses start coming in. Do you need glasses? No, my arms are getting short. <laughs> I've already had LASIK, and I'm like, gosh, darn it. It's too not dark enough. It's too. It's not. I don't have enough brightness. And you know now, <laughs> working on a car the other day, a little Audi. We had to get a part number. It's on this little teeny check valve. I'm like, can you see that? And this little smart out, Chris. I can see that from over here. What are you blind or something? So yeah, I got my, my magnifying glass. I can pro. I can. T- I can taunt you because I'm not to the forty number. I got five years to go. I'm thirty five. So. Yeah, well, there's, there's me taunting yet. Well, I will try time. to help you pay attention, Dave. As you know, it's uh, the race. The racing season starts today. Twenty four hours of Daytona, so it's a perfect day for bad weather. Because I'm going home, slipping on the speed vision, and I'm I'm watching racing. I'm doing something better than that. I'm going to Mon- I'm going to Monster Jam. Uh, I'm going home. I'm getting on the light rail and I'm going up to Monster Jam and I've got pit passes. <laughs> so I remember the first time I took my son to Monster Jam, he sat there with this this crummy look on his face. He was bored until the first one flipped over and a tire came off. Then he was on the edge of his seat. So as is subculture as it is, I love monster trucks. Well, one last one first th- or last thing before we start taking calls, we were talking about the windshield wipers. And I really like a product called Rainex. Speaking of racing, I guarantee you it'll probably be raining in Daytona when these cars are racing for 24 hours nonstop. And you'll see all of those cars have Rain X on the windshield. But it's a great product. There's a link to it on our Facebook page if you go there at bumper2bumperradio.com and find our link or just find us on Facebook. It just shows the difference in this, this the applied versus the unapplied side of the windshield. And you can re- literally drive around with not even using your windshield wipers. It just, the water hits, it's gone, it's right off the window. It's great. So, it's so you're something. a fan of Rain-X. I'm a big fan. You have to apply it carefully and properly, but it, it works awesome. Can so. you apply it in the rain? No. Don't do that. Yeah, All right. No. Dry you want to do it, it's definitely dry. Well, up first this segment, let's go with Don in Phoenix on a 2007 Chrysler Town & Country. Go ahead, Don. You're hey on guys, Bumper to Bumper Radio. Show. Thank you. Um, I'm um, I've got a, a van that's got about 75,000 miles on it, and it's my wife's van, but when I fill it up with gas, the thing, it idles really rough. In fact, the other day for the first time ever, it actually stalled. Uh, it only does it when it's full. When it, and it's like within, I don't know, 15 minutes of driving or so, it, it, it stops doing that, but it just idles rough when it's when I, right after I fill it up. Any warning lights on the dash, check engine light or anything? Uh, nope, not at all. I'm very surprised. I was, I was. If it happens when you're fueling up, I'm suspecting that there's a vent valve or some type of emissions control device near the fuel tank that's allowing raw fuel to get ingested by the engine through a charcoal canister or something like that. But if it, that would still be where I'm thinking, regardless of the fact that there's no check engine light. But I would just think that if the valve or something were stuck open, you'd have a check engine light. So maybe next time you get gas, don't fill up all the way. Go short a couple gallons, see if that has any effect. And if you're topping off, definitely don't top off. Well, that's uh, – I didn't know where you were going to go with that. I was thinking, God, those two can't be related, but I didn't think about that. So you're, you're getting oh, yeah. vapor – or not vapor, but raw fuel is probably getting in the engine. Yeah. And, you know, we see it a lot. It says right in the gas pump. I go. I get my gas at Costco. Don't top off. Don't top off. It's bad for the environment. I'm like, ah, whatever. Global I love warming, topping whatever. off. Yeah. You can't no. tell me not to. <laughs> but but we we start to see these vent valves for emissions control. Toyotas, it they happen all the time. General Motors products. If you're over, if you top off, there's a vent for the air to go at the very top of that filler neck, and you'll run fuel down in there and suck that back through those valves, and you'll ruin. You could very possibly ruin some components over time so just don't top off 
I'm such a topper offer. <laughs> but I think I'm going to do something different. I won't top off from here on out. So thanks for the call, Don. Let's go with uh, – which one should we do there, Matt? It looks like Ed in Sun City on a 2007 Dodge Ram. Go ahead, Ed. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yes, good morning. Good wet morning. Yeah. And this Dodge we've got, my son drives it over the road hauling a trailer, 130000 on it now, but ran fine up until this last trip. Code started popping up. We get the fuel filter change. We do everything limp home. Here we go. Dodge has put on, on the 07 and newer, the emission system. Catalytic converters, all three of them, and the particle separator have plugged up. What a mess that is! Okay, very so that, expensive mess. Yeah, so this is a diesel. So yes, now is. so now is it running better? No, we we're okay. pulling those stuff off. Okay, well, I was going to say that you know that stuff may be bad, and that's that's the byproduct or that's the symptom of the problem. If that if if those converters are plugged up or the the particulate uh, filter. trap filter with the diesel fluid in it. If those are plugged up, there's something else that's causing the problem. You're merely s- fixing the symptom. So, overfueling. In who knows? <clears throat> in 07, and I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not a diesel whiz by any means. But that was something. Was that a change in 2007 where they went to the particulates and the regeneration right process that, and all that? 07 the, area, yeah. Are people getting used to it, or is it still a pain in the neck? Oh, it's a. Uh, no, I, I think it's not as bad as it used to be. I have a friend that has a, a newer diesel truck, and he's always, i got to get in for service because my fluid. Well, you can go buy the fluid at Walmart. Right. Put it in. They have it at Napa, wherever. So, you know, speaking of diesel, though, we have two, we have three shops, actually, at Bumper to Bumper Radio that are Bosch Diesel Service Center. Kurtz Auto Repair, 22nd Avenue and Bell, uh, ADS. And Chandler. Bo- Chandler and Virginia Auto Service. So if you need help with that, Kurtz is a... Probably the great place to start if you're in Phoenix. Well, but for sure, if he was just to go change out those cats and not really address the problem, then we're just going to plug those cats up as well. And it sounds like it's going to be an expensive, expensive process. Well, there's two steps. There's the problem and what caused the problem. So we've got to fix those two things. Thanks for the call, Ed. 602-277-5827. 602-277-KTR. Let's go with Dan in Phoenix on a 1994 Mazda. Go ahead, Dan. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hi. Hey, I've got a question. I've got an older Mazda truck that's got about 220,000 miles on it. I had a, a upper-end rebuild done, did the head uh, about 30,000 miles ago. Ever since then, it's uh, had a lot of pinging and and such when I accelerate, especially when I have uh, any kind of a load in the back of the truck. I'm wondering is it doesn't need a tune-up. I've taken it back to the mechanic, and he doesn't really have any suggestions. Hey, Dan, what we're going to do, because we're coming up against a break, we're going to put you on hold, and we're going to catch you after the break uh, so when we have more time and not music playing in the background. Well, and there's a couple things that to be thinking about that we're going to be wondering about. What type of fuel are you using? I like QT, Circle K, or Shell, Costco. There's a couple that we don't like. Uh, Chevron is another good one. That could be cause a problem. You could have a knock sensor failure. Could be a timing base adjustment issues. There's all kinds of stuff, and we can talk about that in a bit. When we come back, we've got more open lines at 602-277-5827. You are listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio here along with Matt Allen, and we are helping you with your car. As we went to break, we were talking with Dan on a 1994 Mazda truck who was dealing with a ping issue. I think he said 224,000 miles, and there had been some head work done in the past. And uh, Dan, in thinking about it, basically when you have a pinging issue, that's going to be created by uh, too high of cylinder temperatures. You can have too high of cylinder temperatures for a lot of different reasons. Maybe the engine's running warm. Maybe we've got too much timing in it. It's too advanced. Or maybe we're running lean. Right. So those are the things that I'm, I'm considering first. Which one, which one should we be attacking? Dan, but you had some head work done on the car, our top end valve cover, our head head uh, valve job or something like that. What other kind of repairs have you done? Uh, I guess common is uh, valves 
sticking in those. Uh, I had a complete upper end rebuilt. The uh, uh, heads were replaced and completely rebuilt. Uh, did a few other things up on the top. Uh, cylinders looked real good. So, uh, like I said, that was about uh, thirty thousand miles ago. Okay, so this isn't this isn't the new problem after, but it's just something that that's happened, and that's a little background. So, well, like Dave was saying, I mean, you're gonna get you're gonna get pinging from high cylinder temperature, and some of the other things to start thinking about that can cause that are are a lean fuel condition. So, what's gonna cause lean fuel condition? You could have low fuel pressure. It's not gonna deliver enough fuel, and that will cause the cylinder to ping. You get the high temperature, low fuel volume. Pressure is one thing, but you've got to have volume or some amperage. <laughs> right. So fuel filter could be plugged up. That might be something to look at. Now, There's, what do we talked about timing? Does that thing have a distributor on it? 1994, I'm 90, trying to remember. Yeah, 94 is close. It probably does have a distributor. It may or may not have an EGR valve. If the EGR valve is not functioning, again, it's EGR valve is exhaust gas recirculation. That'll, that'll lower the cylinder temperature. Yeah, it's there for emissions. It lowers the cylinder temperature. When they're not working, you can have pinging. Mass airflow sensor, same thing. It could cause the car not to deliver enough fuel. So there's several things that just need to be checked and and uh, gone through. There's just a series of tests, probably no smoking gun or silver bullet, so to speak. And if you're looking for a shop that can do that kind of work, any one of the shops at BumperToBumperRadio.com can handle that. Let's say except for maybe the body shops. They uh, should stick the, with or the, or the collision shop, yeah. right? <laughs> well, thanks for the call, Dan. Let's go with Billy in Scottsdale. Looks like a 2001 E350 van. Go ahead, Billy. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Good morning. I was uh, driving my trusty van around during this recent cold snap, and I was a bit dismayed to notice that my temperature gauge was barely getting into the normal range. You know, I got one of those sweep gauges, and normally it, it, you know, it gets fairly well up into the, you know, up into that normal zone. But d- during this cold snap, it was not getting nearly where it usually uh, winds up resting during my driving around town. So I'm wondering whether that's something I should have looked into. I didn't notice any problems and changes in the engine. Heater worked okay. Um, but uh, it's got 120,000 miles on it. Things are kind of going wrong here and there, so I thought I'd give you a call and see if you had any thoughts on that. Well, Billy, that's a common question that we get. That tire pressure light on, a blue light on the dash, or the engine temperature not getting up is something that we had a lot of questions about when it started to get cold. And, and that was one of the first things I was going to ask you is how's the heater working, but you said it seemed to be okay. I imagine it probably took a little bit longer to get it up to where you think it's okay. And, and it's probably not enough to where the computer's going to be freaking out or it's not getting warm enough faster. But at the same time, I don't think you need to just go run into the shop and make some special visit. But it probably wouldn't be bad with that kind of mileage when you're due for cooling system maintenance, maybe before the spring. Go ahead and have flush somebody flush the system, put a new radiator cap, put a new thermostat in it, that's going to help with the overall efficiency of the vehicle, fuel mileage, emissions controls. Everything's going to work right. That's one of the major inputs. Well, and that's a big thing. If a car, we were talking on the previous phone call about cylinder temperature is too high. You know, an engine that's not up to operating temperature, that 200 mark or 210 degrees that we want to see them at, it's not running efficient. So we got cylinder temperature too cool. Well, the transmission could shift differently. on, on If the computer thinks the car is cooler than it is, it might... Uh, shift differently. It's going to definitely get different fuel mileage. Well, for sure, a lot of like Toyotas are the most noticeable with the transmission. If if you're low on temperature, it is not going to lock up the torque converter until it comes up to a good temperature. So you're losing efficiency there. The other thing it does is it holds on to gears longer before it upshifts. That way you get up a little higher in the RPM, lets that engine get up to operating temperature as quickly as possible. And I'm thinking on the engine side, if you're over-delivering fuel, that fuel is going into the oil, you're now diluting your oil. In, in extreme cases, we see cars that come in with the dips, you check the oil and it's overfilled. It's fuel, oftentimes from it running rich. So it's worth checking, but not in a freak out mode. Thanks for the call, Billy. Let's go with, it looks like, John on a 2006 Durango. Go ahead, John. You are on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hi. Um, uh, when I fill up with gas and you uh, you know have it set so it fills up automatically, when the nozzle gas nozzle clicks off, gas starts spewing onto the ground. 
And it's happened at different stations, not just at first I thought it was a gas pump, but it's happened at different stations. Has that truck ever been in a collision or had any damage around that fuel filler fuel filler no. neck or gas cap or anything like that? No? No. Hmm. <laughs> I think if there's a problem with the filler neck or the, the tank is not venting right. I mean, it should be. Well, yeah, that's why it's puking because it's you can't if the air. Is, if you're going to put fuel in, you've got it, you're taking up that space. You've got to push, you've got to push some fuel out. So that. But I'm talking out loud a little bit. Is that what is it that clicks that fuel lever off? Is it going to be the the feedback on pressure, or what is it that lets it know it's full? Because I don't know that. Yeah, I don't know. That's it's well, a good question. But there's something there's something wrong with the filler neck or something. Well, apparently, John, we don't know the answer, so we got to go back to school, um, <laughs> or we need to learn to make stuff up. <laughs> But the, but there's something going on there. So yeah. I think I <laughs> think there's Dave. a there's a filler neck problem. Uh, something going on with the filler neck that's a restriction. Something like that. Yeah, I, it's just or, something that somebody's gonna have to look at. It's uh, I can't think of anything, but I'm gonna look. Um, we'll go to a little database resource that we have and see if there's some some common issue or or something that we can come up with. Well, now that you now that you stump Matt, uh, now that you stump Matt, you have to send us an email at bumper to bumper radio dot com on the contact link. Uh, send it to Matt. Say, hey, listen, we I called Saturday. You didn't know what the heck I was talking about. I need an answer, and Matt is going to get you an answer. I will do that. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, hey, I had an email this week uh, on a BMW owner from bumper to bumper. He had a a transmission issue or he thought he had a transmission issue, and he wanted to know, he'd been doing a little bit of Google Gnostics, <laughs> and uh, he wanted to know if he could, he had seen online that he could, the computer could be reflashed, and this would fix his transmission issue. This is the guy that you had call me about the... Exactly. The okay. And I sent him to Matt, because Matt is one of the few shops that can actually go in and re-update the software in the BMW computers. There's not a lot of guys that can do that, but he's, t- he's spent the money to buy all that stuff to do that. And the further you talked with him, the less it sounded like we were really even dealing with the transmission issue. Well, yeah, he says, I want to get... I, I, there's a reprogramming... For my computer, and I think that's what the problem is. I've been online, and so I, I started going down the road with him. You know, I let him pull me astray from my normal thing. He's pulling me down the road. And I said, "Well, wait a minute. You're talking about all this stuff. You want to have the computer reprogrammed, and, and yeah, they do need a programming a lot of times. But what we need to find out what the codes are. Oh, I've already done that. It's a PO one seventy one and a one seventy four. Well, that's for a lean condition. That has nothing to do at all with a transmission issue. Nothing. So once we start talking about it, I mean, he's going down the, the wrong path. There. It's, whoa, 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 whoa. Slow your roll. Slow. <laughs> All we need to do, in that case, there's a lean condition. We just need to go diagnose and test that problem. You very well may, may need a transmission update, and that's what you're thinking in your head, so you're able to find what you wanted to find. But no, it, it's not anything to do with that. So, Well, and if you're listening, you're thinking, what the heck are these guys talking about? Every now and then you come to your computer, you turn it on, your computer, your PC at home, and there's, it says there's updates ready for your computer or the automatic updates turn, happened last night. You didn't even know it. Cars have the same thing. There's software in there. As the cars age, the software sometimes needs to change. Or as the vehicle has been on the market longer, the manufacturer recognizes an issue that they can correct through software. Well, yeah, they didn't realize that when the car had 90,000 miles on it, it was going to perform like this or like that. So since everything on these cars now is controlled or operated by a computer or some kind of controller, we'll just, oh, we have this problem? Okay, we'll we'll delay the transmission shift 200 more RPMs. Or we'll um, allow closed-loop operation at a higher temperature versus a lower temperature. I mean, you name it. There's all well, kinds of Let's talk about a things. scenario, uh, evaporative uh Evaporative, well, catalytic converter, sorry, catalytic converter uh, efficiency codes. Some of those are fixed by just changing the parameter at which point that code sets. Maybe they figured, hey, we ran this too tight. We're getting all these evap codes, or I'm sorry, uh, cat codes. Efficiency codes. And, and what we're talking about, there's an oxygen sensor or an air fuel ratio sensor on the inlet of the catalytic converter, and there's one at the outlet. If they see the same thing, the converter in the middle is not doing his job. So the idea is that what's going in should, or what's coming out needs to be significantly less than what went in. And that's pre-programmed and built into this whole strategy and programming of the car. Well, 
over time they recognize, oh, that tolerance is too tight. Let's open that window. We mm. reprogram it. That happens a lot in Toyota, a lot in BMW, General Motors, and Ford, Chrysler. The American cars are the biggest offenders. We're, we're, I mean, we're fixing a lot, a lot of transmissions with software updates, but we don't just go do it. We diagnose a specific problem. In General Motors, for instance, there's there could be ten different different deals for different symptoms. So we like to go after the specific symptom. So we've got Brian on the line, and then we've got open lines at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTR. You are listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I'm looking out the window, and it is still raining. I'm not looking forward to this show being over and having to walk to my car. So I'm Matt. He's Dave. We're Bumper to Bumper Radio, and we are here every single Saturday from 11 to noon helping you with your car and all you have to do if you want some help, have a question, need some advice, is call us, 602-277-5827. Today we're talking about all kinds of stuff, windshield wipers, rain racing, CV do you, boots. Do you use rain on your head, on your melon? I mean, you're talking about walking through. We talk about hair, and I've got a lot of hair, and you've got no hair. I was, I was kind of <laughs> laughing today thinking as I'm running in here, I'm going, should have had an umbrella. Then I think, well, what are, what's getting wet? My head, it just, it's not a little <laughs> bit of oil on there, you know? It's uh, the natural the natural shine, and that water repels right off. <laughs> right. So, water off Matt's head, not a duck's back. That's so, right. That's right. We are going to go, looks like, with Brian and Avondale on a Dodge Diesel. Go ahead, Brian. You are on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Okay, that guy with a Dodge. Uh, in 2007, the newer Dodge pickups, the only one I know of with diesel in it, that you have to use a special oil in the tra- in the motor. You have to be sulfur-free, or it'll plug the converters right back up again. Oh, yeah, yeah, you've got it. That's a good point. And I th- in most all the oils that you get now are are sulfur-free, and, and if you're using the right, I wouldn't necessarily call it a special oil, but probably using a 15W40 oil that's the most popular for a diesel truck. But, you know, there's the new Ford, and there's a different, you know, there's a different, I think that uses like a 540 now. So you never can tell with oil, and it's always best to refer to your owner's manual to make sure you're using the right oil for sure. And that's, you know, we talk on the show regularly about how the rules have changed in auto repair or owning a vehicle. What worked 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, it's, it's totally different, and it's changing more rapidly. And so we want to keep you up on this so that some of that old farm advice that you get to your, from your well-to-do neighbor, uh, he's still talking about cars that we're not even really seeing and things you go about. We're talking about getting out a laptop computer and going in and changing the software to fix your squeak. I mean, <laughs> it, literally, it's it's... I mean, some of the farm mentality still works on, you know, if we're working on a 1977 something or other, but most of the stuff we're working on is 97 and newer. And, and But Brian's point is great, is that the fluid, you don't want to mess with different, I mean, there's so many different fluids. I mean, when you come into my shop, there's a whole wall of all the different transmission fluids, and there's a reason I stock every last one of them. Yeah. You know, I talked to some other shop, and I mean, they're gee, are they coming to me? And they say, why do you have all, it's just so expensive to have all this stuff. There's no way I would stock that. I'm just using this and everything. Uh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the right way. So yes, refer, refer to your manual, use the right stuff. Try not to skimp on the right oil. It just costs, it could void your warranty in some cases or For just sure. cost you in the long run. And we did have a, a guy contact us on email that does oil testing and Real interesting guy, and a lot we can learn from him. So we'll we'll do something with that in the show to come. Let's go with Kevin in Glendale on a 2002 Tahoe. Go ahead, Kevin. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. How are you guys doing today? Great. Thank you. I got a, a 2002 Chevy Tahoe. I bought it for my brother about a year ago, and he hadn't done a tune-up on it in, since he's had it. He bought it new, and it's got over 200,000 miles on it. Yeah, the truck runs great once it warms up, but when you do the first start of the morning, it's got a really bad miss. I replaced all eight of the spark plugs and put new plugs in it. All the coils seem to be okay, but it keeps spitting out a uh, code saying that the uh, knock sensor is bad. You know, but it, it, is the knock sensor the only code that you're getting? 
it gets uh, some lean, fuel mixture, like too lean. Yeah, sometimes, that, but that, not all the time. That that's pretty common. It's probably pretty easy to fix for you. We see a lot of the Chevy V8, General Motors V8s, with knock sensor codes. Those knock sensors are down in the valley yeah. pan of the V8, and we see a lot of times corrosion. After, well, corrosion or people that wash their engine a lot. The water gets down there and promotes some rust. The next thing you said was a lean code. Very common problem on those, and the easy way to diagnosis is you have a you probably have an intake manifold gasket that's leaking. And it's sucking vacuum when it gets cold, and as it warms up, the metal expands, the plastic gets hot, and you have a little bit of expansion, and it may seal up where that gasket's leaking. So the thing to do is start that up while it's cold, and if it's running bad, you can have some carburetor spray and spray it around the base of the intake manifold on either side of the engine. It's usually up towards the back half. And if, or you can even use propane. You need to be careful, though, and make sure there's no arcing spark plug wires or anything like that that could ignite and cause a fire. But when you hit that area with propane or hit it with uh, carburetor spray or cleaner, you'll, it might k- try to kill the engine, or you might see a significant increase in the idle speed. You're looking for a change. Yeah, and there's no coolant in that intake manifold, so that's really, for someone that's pretty mechanically inclined, that is not that difficult of a job. It'll take you an afternoon. Uh, but it, you know, if you're not, if you don't really know what you're doing, it's not something to to tackle. For sure. Well, thanks for the call, Kevin. Let's go with Donna in Chandler on a 2002 Saturn View. Go ahead, Donna. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yes, hi. Um, I have a 2002 Saturn View, and I just brought it into the dealership today to have the oil change and to check the AC because the AC was actually blowing warm air. And when I took it in, they looked at it. They said that I needed a new compressor, a hose that goes to the compressor, and a cabin filter. They kind of quoted me a sticker shock price, $1,500. Um, so I'm just trying to see, I, I mean, I don't, you know, you get what you pay for, so I don't want a cheap job done, but what is your view, what is your point of view on that for a car that old? Why did they, why did they recommend a compressor to you? Did they say why? They said they, they did the diagnostic, they did the Freon to check for a leak, and they found there was a leak coming from the compressor. Okay, and that that makes sense. I, I'm not terribly shocked at the fifteen hundred dollar price because that would be you 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 typically need to replace when we say everything in the air conditioning system. There's three parts: the compressor as a whole would be considered one thing, the dryer, which is a separator or a dryer to keep the uh, keeps the moisture out of the refrigerant. And then you have the orifice tube or the expansion device, and you typically need to replace all three of those. So I don't think the the price is terrible is out of of is out of range. Mm -hmm. You can, you know, sometimes and it's on a case by case basis. We will replace just the compressor if it's leaking. When you have the AC system that blows up, or we call it black death, that whole thing just comes apart and disintegrates, we want to do everything because you don't know if how much of that got pumped through the system. But if you simply have a leak, sometimes we will replace just that leaking component if it's the compressor. Well, her question, a little bit, what I was catching on is, do is it worth putting that kind of money in an old car? And I don't, she didn't. Something like that is, you know, and it's a O2 Saturn view, and that relates back to our show topic last week. You know, if it's a good car, it runs good. You've kept up on oil changes like you were down there voluntarily spending money to change the oil. You were obviously maintaining it. You know, if this car's only, you know, got 120, 130, 150,000 miles on it, it's still got life in it. So, but that's something you have to calculate to see how much longer am I going to keep this vehicle? Is it worth putting in the $1,500? What other repairs could I expect, and is it worth it? And our point last week was, believe it or not, it pencils out to keep that car a lot of times. Most of the time. I didn't pick up that part, but, you know, she's got a car that we call an orphan. An orphan? There's no deal. There isn't a Saturn dealer. There's not a Pontiac dealer, although, there, you know, you can General right. Motors dealership. So, But, you yeah. know, in Chandler, there's automotive diagnostic. I don't know what uh, part of Chandler you're in, but they do a great job, too, if you want a second opinion. Yeah, the South Tempe, Chandler area, automotive diagnostic specialties would be a great resource. Desert there. Car Care is another one, just they're, depending on which part of Chandler. And they're you're on bumper-to-bumper-radio.com. You can find them there. 
I, I'm almost sure, and I can say this with confidence, that they will do a free second opinion for you and, and, and let you know what they think. But back to your original question, the price isn't out of range, and it's, it's, it would be normal. For sure. Well, thanks for sharing your Saturday with us. We hope that we lowered your automotive anxieties. That's our point. We want to make it, uh, make it not a painful process for you. So if you've got a relationship with a good shop, stick with them. If you're looking for a good shop, bumper to bumperradiocom He is Matt Allen. I am Dave Riccio. And from all the shops at Bumper to Bumper Radio, have a great weekend.